All right, hey guys, and welcome to another video. So as of recording this, we are just a couple of days away from the event where Microsoft is going to be showing off a bunch of gameplay for the Xbox One Series X. And I figured this would be a really fun time to sit down and reminisce about my memories and my history, essentially recap what it was like for me getting the original Xbox. What did I go with first? You know, when did I get my Xbox? What kind of games did I play? What convinced me to get an Xbox? Because I wasn't completely on board when I first saw it in the launch games. So we're going to get into that. So I did make a sheet here that I have off to the side because I have a lot of dates and things in chronological order. That way I don't get all scatterbrained trying to think like, oh, did this come out before this? Did I play that before that? So this way it won't be an issue. So let's just start with the release dates, right? So Xbox originally launched on November 15th, 2001, but there's a very important detail here. The GameCube also launched three days later on November 18th, 2001. Now I couldn't get both. However, I was fortunate enough to have a birthday around that time, very close to it. So I was able to pick one and, you know, a small handful of launch games because I had enough money, accumulated gift cards, whatnot for my birthday. However, I couldn't get both. So did I go with the GameCube or did I go with the original Xbox? It was a hard decision. The GameCube had launch games like Luigi's Mansion, Super Monkey Ball, Wave Race, Star Wars. You know, a pretty solid little batch of launch lineup games. And the Xbox had Halo uh, and Mad Dash Racing. So needless to say, I went with the GameCube. The launch lineup, much better. Couldn't turn it down, right? A Luigi's Mansion game? Come on. Super Monkey Ball? Wave Race? Star Wars? It was pretty obvious I was going with the GameCube. But it was a matter of time, you know? I had to... I had to wait. When was I going to get my original Xbox? What game were they going to release that was going to push me over the edge and say, I need this console now? What later features would they come out with, such as Xbox Live, that would say to me, you know, hey... You need this console now. You know, you don't need to wait another year or two. Now is the time to get it. So let's break this down. It's also important to know what I was playing at the time. I was playing PlayStation 2. Games like Final Fantasy XI came out the next year, uh, May 16th, 2002. I was knee deep into playing that. It was my first true MMO RPG experience. And then not long after that, August 27th, 2002 was the launch gate date of the original SOCOM. And any of you that know me, you know my history with the original SOCOM. I put a couple thousand hours into that game. So I was, you know, I needed a, a, a really good reason to abandon my PlayStation 2, essentially, and look into other avenues for online multiplayer games. Now, exactly one year later, after the release of the original Xbox, they announced and released uh, Xbox Live. But that wasn't the one thing that pushed me over the edge. That had something to do with it. But there was one game in particular that... I don't remember the exact history behind it, but I remember picking up a magazine. I don't remember where the magazine was from. I don't remember which magazine it was. It was probably the official Xbox magazine. And I came across a spread. I think it was a review or a preview or something for Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. And I just remember reading this review and saying to myself, Oh my, oh my God, like the GameCube the PlayStation 2, they they don't offer an experience like this. Never before had I read in a magazine about a game that offered such open world and freedom to do what you want, uh, such a living, breathing world with Morrowind. And just reading that article, not even really having to see much gameplay, just seeing the screenshots, I, I knew it. This was the game to push me over the edge and want an Xbox. And sure enough, Morrowind was the game that was my system seller. However, the launch of Xbox Live also had something to do with it because I had made friends on SOCOM and a lot of them were talking about, hey, we're going to get Xbox Live, you know, we're going to be playing Ghost Recon and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, I can get in on this because I had my little competitive group of friends that I was playing SOCOM with. And if they were getting it, I'd have people to play with. So I'm like, all right, this is, this is a good enough reason. So day one, and I still have it right here, I went out to a store, I think it was like a micro center or something. And I went in, you know, this is back before pre-orders were really a thing. And I went in just hoping that they still had Xbox Live in stock. And they had a single one left on the shelf. I got the very last box of Xbox Live. Now, if you don't remember, you didn't download this as a service. You went and purchased a physical starter kit. And this is my original starter kit. 
It actually retailed for $49.99. Apparently, the place I bought it from had a little bit of a little bit of a price increase there. I don't know if that was uh, I don't know if that was legal or what, but it was supposed to be $49.99. And this is the my original box from almost 20 years ago. As you can see, it's a little beat up here. And it would come with a headset, and it came with a demo for Wacked and MotoGP, and a couple of pamphlets in here. But I just thought it was cool, you know. As a collector, I'm sure some of you can sympathize and relate. Uh, <laughs> Even though this thing has no functional value anymore, to me, the, the personal value of this and the memories of this empty box here with a couple of pamphlets just sitting in there about advertising Xbox Live and the games, uh, this means so much to me, right? Because this is, I have an amazing memory picking up the last box in the store and going home and being so excited because after that, who knows when they were going to get the next shipment in. So what did I get with Xbox Live Arcade? So... A few games actually here, and I didn't even realize this, a few games actually launched before the release of Xbox Live, and those games were Mech Assault, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, Unreal Championship, and Moto, well, the Moto GP, I, we'll get to Moto GP in a second, but mainly the main three, Mech Assault, Ghost Recon, and Unreal Championship, those came out a few days before Xbox Live, which was interesting, why not launch them on the same day? But man, let me tell you, Xbox Live, the original Xbox Live, booting up your Xbox, and having a friends list, it was mind-blowing, because the PlayStation 2, when I was playing SOCOM, we didn't have a friends list. If you wanted to know if your friends were online, you had to manually search from room to room and just look for them. You had to, I don't know, message them on ALO with Instant Messenger, call them on the phone. Like, there was no easy way. So having a laid-out friends list where you can see, like, oh, my, that guy's online, he's online, that was a really cool feature. Something else, too, voice chat. I remember being able to get into, like, voice chat parties. Um, and that was kind of fun, especially for my SOCOM friends, you know, having a place where we can meet and talk all at the same time. Because don't forget, with SOCOM, in order to talk in that game, you'd have to hold a button and wait your turn to speak one at a time. So it was kind of neat to have this sort of pre-Skype-like uh, voice program built into Xbox Live to talk with your friends. Pretty mind-blowing. I know today people would just be like, what's the big deal about that? But back then, you remember, it was it was really cool. So, I got my Xbox exactly a year later with the release of Xbox Live, and I went out to the stores and I bought Mech Assault, Ghost Recon, and Unreal Championship. What an amazing selection of games to start Xbox Live with. My main game was Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon because coming from a competitive background with SOCOM, it was a very easy transition going into Ghost Recon. And this was really, from what I recall, the first first-person shooter that I played online couldn't really think of anything else prior to that except for maybe Tribe's Aerial Assault on the PlayStation 2. But this one was the first one that I played with voice voice comms because Tribes did not have voice communication and it was really slow and methodical and I just remember really having a lot of fun with my friends playing that online. It was so much different from SOCOM, so much more, well, a lot of campers, I do remember that, but it was a very different and fun experience. And Mech Assault, wow, what a great game to launch with Xbox Live. I mean, if you had Xbox Live, you had Mech Assault, or at least you played some kind of demo or something. I don't even, I don't even know if they had a demo available before, but you you definitely played or rented Mech Assault at some point. You know, third-person online mech combat. It was amazing. There was nothing like that on the PlayStation 2 at the time. And Unreal Championship. Um, this is the moment where I realized that, wow, I'm actually pretty good at you know, pretty much any online shooting game that I was playing at the time on the PlayStation or the Xbox, I was doing really well. You know, I was the leader of one of the top clans in SOCOM, and I don't want this to be too much about SOCOM and PlayStation 2, but it's important to realize my, my history and the ties that I had to the shooting game online community at that time. And I led one of the top clans in SOCOM. So coming over to a game like Unreal Championship, I guess my I just, my, my skills just carried over because I was just destroying people in that game. And I wish I went further with it, you know, because um, I think I could have had something. You know, if, if competitive shooting, online competitive games were more of a thing back then, um, I, I really could have, I could have gone somewhere with that. I really think because almost any game I played, I was, I was usually always top of the leaderboard every game I played. And in terms of like games within like, you know, matches, in other words, uh, and I really enjoyed Unreal Championship. Three different types of experiences. That slow first-person shooter, the really hyper-fast uh, first-person shooter with Unreal Championship, and the third-person uh, 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 combat in Mech Assault was a great way to start the launch of Xbox Live. 
And of course, MotoGP. Shoutouts to the demo that they included with the Xbox Live Starter Kit with MotoGP. Never bought the game, but we played a lot of that demo, me and my buddies. Uh, we just sat in there and just kept doing the same track over and over and over. It was actually a kind of cool way to just hang out and talk, sort of like an online chat lobby with, you know, just racing. It was fun without ever having to buy the game. And then, not long after that, November 22nd, 2002, the release of Morrowind, the reason I bought my Xbox came out, and it was not a disappointment. It was worth the purchase of that console. Morrowind was mind-blowing at the time. Uh, and I'll actually have a link. I, I recently revisited Morrowind for the first time ever since the launch of the game, and I streamed it. So I'll have links to that down below if you're interested in checking out what it was like for me to revisit Morrowind after you know, 18 years of not playing it. And that was a really fun experience. It felt like playing the game all over again for the first time because, you know, so much time had passed. But I don't want to hinge too much on Morrowind, but it was a transformative experience. You know, it was a PC game ported to console. You know, yes, it was buggy. Yes, it was a little glitchy, but it was a really good port. And it really made me even more of a fan of the RPG genre because, yes, I was playing RPGs, but, man, it really put me in the mood for more open-world games such as this in the future. I was on board for everything to come in the Elder Scrolls series after that. Now, you're probably wondering, what about that Halo game? You know, why, aren't, why haven't you really mentioned Halo yet? And uh, maybe this will be hard to believe, but I, I never bought Halo. I actually just rented Halo. It was a rental. I played it. I beat it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. But uh, the fact that Halo did not have online multiplayer or, you know, released a second version of the game with online multiplayer, you would think that they would have done something like that, right? Release a second version of the original Halo with online multiplayer. But I guess they were just waiting for Halo 2 for that to be the big, the big uh, console seller. But if I had SOCOM and Ghost Recon and Normal Championship and whatnot, I had no reason to buy a first-person shooter without online multiplayer. It was a really big deal to me. I was very competitive with my online games back then, and after I finished the single-player campaign, I was like, well, that's uh, that's about it. So I didn't buy Halo until much, much later when you can get it in a bargain bin for like 5 or 10 bucks. Um, but other rentals that I made, the thing that I found about the Xbox is... You know, I bought exclusives on the PlayStation 2. I bought exclusives on the GameCube. Um, my multi-platform system was usually the PlayStation 2 or the GameCube. I didn't really buy multi-platform games on the original Xbox. The Xbox for me was a rental system, essentially. Uh, a lot of the games that I played, and this was really fascinating for me, going back and looking through the, the list of every game released for the console and remembering, wait, I never bought that. I rented that game. I never realized how much renting I did for this system, but here's just a list of some of the games I remember renting. Halo, of course, Jet Set Radio Future, Hunter the Reckoning, that was a really fun rental to play, two-player local co-op. Mad Dash Racing, which was one of my most anticipated games at the launch. I know you think I was probably joking, but Mad Dash Racing was actually one of the only reasons I considered getting an original Xbox at the at the launch of the system. Uh, but that made a good rental. I was a little disappointed in it, not, not as good as I thought it was going to be. That's the on-foot racing game with the animals. It's sort of a spiritual follow-up to, uh, what's it called, Running Wild on the PlayStation 1, which I was also a pretty big fan of. Blood Wake was a great rental, a good show showpiece for the console. Uh, Blinks was good. Good thing I rented that back then because I uh, back then I wasn't the biggest fan of Blinks, though I've kind of come around to it recently after revisiting it all these years later. But that was that was definitely a good a rental. Um, and then here's one that I wish I rented, and this is actually a recommendation for any of you out there that are currently collecting for the original Xbox. It's nice and cheap. But the one game that I wish I bought or rented and really regret not playing until about two or three years ago is Azuric. It was not a launch game. It came out like a month, I think, after the release of the original console. I don't have a release date here for it. But I went back and played that recently, and wow, what an amazing third-person action game. It's the, it's the game with like the Avatar Blue guy that has the giant staff and everything, but coming back to it, Man, that game is really lush and colorful, and the environments are uh, really fleshed out and fun to explore, and the game is dirt cheap, so if you're looking for something to play on your original Xbox, I highly recommend Azuric or Azuric. 
So it was sort of a dry period, right? After the initial wave of Xbox Live Arcade or Xbox Live games, rather, and Morrowind and my rentals, it was definitely a period of playing other things, playing the PlayStation 2, playing the GameCube. Um, the only things I really dabbled in and I have written down here were Fantasy Star Online 1 and 2, which came out in uh, 2003, early 2003. I think I bought that used at GameStop later in the year, and that was my first time playing a Fantasy Star Online game. I didn't play the one on the Dreamcast, so I wish I had the ability to play it online. I just didn't have the ability to play Dreamcast Online back then. And that was kind of fun for a month. I remember, the, the thing I m remember most vividly about Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 is that I played it for a month, and you had to have a subscription service. So on top of your Xbox subscription, you also had to pay a monthly fee for, for Fantasy Star, and I kind of forgot to cancel my subscription after I stopped playing for like eight months. So yeah, that was, uh, that was very unfortunate. Ended up being like a $100 game. I'll never forget that. And then the next big one, this is eight months after the release of Morrowind. So there's sort of this eight month dry period of just renting games here and there from Blockbuster or Hollywood Video or whatnot. The next big one was Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which came out on July 15th, 2003. As a big fan of Star Wars and as a big fan of RPGs, um, that may have even been more hyped up for me than Morrowind's release. And it did not disappoint. Once again, another game that really, there was no experience quite like it on the GameCube or the PlayStation 2. Sort of like a big open world PC quality game ported to home console. And it was another great reason to own the original Xbox. I don't remember being disappointed with it. You know, I thought it was um, a little bit of a slow burn in terms of... I remember the beginning of the game taking a little bit to get going in terms of like feeling powerful as your character. But I get that was the point. But that's kind of one of the things I remember about it. But I just remember that game feeling like Star Wars. Something else really important to remember is prior to the release of KOTOR, now granted I had not really played many of the PC Star Wars games, um, this is the first Star Wars game that I played that really made me feel like I was in a Star Wars universe. You know, playing in my style in a, a good or an evil way and dialogue trees and building my character the way I saw fit. Did I want to use this kind of sword or did I want to use this kind of lightsaber later on? Um, it was a really, really memorable experience, and I remember the music feeling like Star Wars. I mean, it was... It's very important, by the way, in Star Wars games. If you're playing a game that doesn't use, like, the, the usual licensed soundtrack, it's really important that the music feels like it's from the Star Wars universe. And I don't remember the KOTOR soundtrack disappointing in that way. So that was the next big release that got me really hyped and proud to be an owner of an original Xbox. And... My rental period after that was really, um, it was another dry spell after KOTOR, honestly. I think I played stuff like Ghost Recon Island Thunder or something, uh, the expansion for that. Um, I rented Sudeki, which was a really strange and not-so-memorable third-person action RPG. Um, I never played Fable. I know, right? Big shocker. It's like, I'm, I'm hammering you guys with these big Xbox games that I either rented or never played. And uh, yeah, I never played the original Fable. Just something about the art style and the humor, like the character designs, just did not appeal to me at all. Um, I also, you know, I don't know, I just got done not long ago playing KOTOR, and I really wasn't in the mood for another good and evil, choose your, choose your path kind of game. I, there's just some, and I still haven't played Halo, I mean, Fable 2 or 3, and I really have no intention to. There's just something about that series that's really off-putting to me. Um, the next big one, this is about a year after the release of KOTOR, so another year dry period, once again, of just renting a game here and there, was Star Wars Battlefront, which was on September 20th, 2004. Once again, big Star Wars fan, having the ability to buy a Star Wars game that had online multiplayer in third person, it was it was like, wow, this is going to be the SOCOM of Star, like, Star Wars games, essentially. And uh, what was my verdict on it? I wasn't the biggest fan, actually. I know that might surprise some of you. Um, I know there's a lot of fans of Battlefront. Now, my memories are a little foggy, but the only thing I remember is buying that game on day one, being super hyped. Keep in mind, during all this time, during this dry period, I am knee-deep into playing SOCOM, which is a really precise, pinpoint, tactical online shooting game, right? So I couldn't help but compare that to Battlefront. Going straight from SOCOM, like literally straight from SOCOM, like the day before I'm just 
playing SOCOM for like eight hours a night. And then the next day I'm playing Battlefront. The controls and the loose aiming and the inaccuracies of certain weapons just weren't jiving for me. The movement felt kind of loose. There was just something about it that didn't feel right. And I do blame SOCOM for that. I really feel like if I wasn't so, you know, having at this point probably invested well over a thousand to fifteen hundred hours in the SOCOM, I think I would have approached Battlefront a little bit differently. So that was sort of a game that I only played for a few weeks, I believe, and then I kind of just went back to SOCOM. Probably, honestly, I probably played it up until the beginning of November, because guess what came out at the beginning of November in the same year? Um, actually, hold on, I'm looking at my years here. Uh, SOCOM 2, maybe, hold on. I have down here SOCOM 2, November 4th, 2003. Let me actually confirm this live. SOCOM, I know, I should edit this out, but... I just want to make sure that I have this correct because this is actually kind of important. Well, okay, so it was 2003. November 4th, 2003 uh, was the release of SOCOM 2. So at that point, I was already playing SOCOM 2 um, for about almost a year at this point. So to go from SOCOM 2, rather, to Battlefront was, it was a really big switch for me. Um, but there's another game that came out at the beginning of November in the year 2004 that Battlefront came out, and that was Halo 2. Now, this is different. It wasn't the same as Halo 1 for me because I had built up even more friends in the SOCOM games. And we were all playing competitively together. So for the release of Halo 2, that was a game changer. We all just up and left SOCOM 2 for I don't know how long it was. It was probably like a month or two where we just did nothing but play Halo 2. So my entire clan just transplanted ourselves in the halo 2 and we were wrecking shop once again i mean i just have so many great memories with my clanmates but taking one of the greatest clans from socom 1 and 2's history and transitioning over in the socom or uh, halo 2 we cleaned up everybody i don't think we lost like maybe one or two clan matches we lost and you're probably wondering wait how did you do clan matches back then you might remember a site called SOCOM Battles, which eventually evolved into GameBattles.com after the scope of SOCOM sort of expanded for that website beyond just the SOCOM series. You might remember GameBattles.com, which was the earliest website for documenting clan matches between different clans. So you would register all your clan members' names on there, you would manually challenge other clans, you would do your clan match, and then you would manually submit and both clans would verify that, yes, this took place, yes, they won, yes, we lost, here was the score, and then you would get ranked based on how many wins and losses you have. So it was a, a manual process, very early days of online competitive, you know, esports, essentially. And uh, we were one of the best Halo 2 clans. I don't remember what we were called. Um, I, th I don't remember which name we went with in Halo 2, uh, because we had my, S my SOCOM clan name was SKO, Sudden Kill Organization. And eventually we sort of had a renaming, a rebranding, where we called ourselves Legacy. I don't remember what we went with in, in Halo 2. It was probably SKO. I, I really don't remember. But anyway, that's besides the point. We really enjoyed Halo 2, and I really enjoyed Halo 2. I had such a blast playing that game for, um, I don't know, the foreseeable, like, probably next year or so at least. My memory's a little bit shaky how I went between Halo and the SOCOM series, you know. But these are just a rough guideline. Um, and apparently, based on my, my timeline that I have here, I didn't buy anything else. Actually, I'm just looking ahead here. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much it. The only other games that I bought for my Xbox after Halo 2 were mostly were Siberia. What a terrible decision. And Splinter Cell, which I couldn't really get into, even though I bought that game because it just looked amazing. It looked amazing. That's the main reason I bought it, but I just couldn't get into it. And believe it or not, Splinter Cell is one of the reasons that pushed me away from stealth games for so long because of how much I regretted that purchase because I just couldn't get into the stealth gameplay. However, in years recently, I have been really enjoying a lot of the stealth games I've been playing, and I, I feel kind of bad for missing out on the genre. But I'm revisit, uh, going back to it and revisiting a lot of the series now that I've never touched before. But yeah, I mean, just between Halo 2 and, of course, I kept playing my PlayStation 2 online, uh, you know, I was here. Let me reiterate 
I wasn't buying new games. I was buying used games, like going to GameStop, EB Games, or whatever, and buying used games. I actually bought Steel Battalion. I think I got that on eBay for like 150 ship. No, or did I get that at EB Games? I don't remember, but I paid like only 120, 150 dollars for a complete inbox Steel Battalion. I bought games like Panzer Dragoon or to um, and whatnot, but very sparingly. Uh, a lot of my rentals were games like Psychonauts, Jade Empire, Conquer Live and Reloaded, which was a really fun rental. I remember liking that game online. But the reason why it kind of slowed down is because, don't forget, the Xbox 360 actually launched November 22nd, 2005. So I had a good three years with my original Xbox before the next coming of uh, Microsoft's Xbox 360, which was a completely different experience for me. I actually made a video years and years ago uh, going over my memories of the Xbox 360 launch, and it's a complete... Uh, pun wasn't in intended, but now it's intended. It was a complete 360 from my experience with the original Xbox because I was, I was in from launch, you know, about a month after the launch of the Xbox 360 because I just couldn't get one on day one. It was, it was too hard. Um, but I camped out in line for like 24 hours. I got a bunch of launch games, Xbox Live from day one. Like I was a huge fan of the Xbox 360. So it was a good kind of change of pace. But look, there's a completely different video for that. I'll actually have the link for that at the end of this video or in the description if you want to check that out afterwards. But uh, yeah, I mean, that that was my history with the original Xbox. It was kind of eye opening for me where I looking back, I'm like, wow, I bought and played you know, just a few of the heavy hitters for the Xbox Live service, and then everything else was mostly just rentals. But I didn't have a bad experience. I didn't have a bad any bad memories or experiences with the original Xbox. Like, I, I just remember having a lot of fun with Xbox Live's launch, enjoying Halo, enjoying Ghost Recon, Unreal Championship, you know? Uh, it was it was fun, and the rentals I played were really great. And a lot of the games that I did rent, I, I would eventually go back and buy them used, like Jet Set Radio, Mad Dash Racing. And uh, now, however... What am I doing with the original Xbox now? I'm a little late to the party. I haven't been collecting for the original Xbox quite as much as I have for, say, the PlayStation 2 over the years. But lately, I have been going back and picking up a lot of games that I previously had missed out on. And I'm just waiting for the right moment to get around to playing a lot of them. Some of my favorites that I've bought since then uh, were games like Outrun 2 and Outrun 2006 Coast to Coast. Amazing games. Wow, Outrun 2. How I wish I played that on um, Xbox Live back in the day when it was still available to play with a bunch of people. You can use Xlink Kai, which is a program to play these games now with people online even after the servers are down. I've actually done that a little bit with the Xbox, and that's been a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, I don't want to ramble on too much. That's kind of just my, my history and my recap with the original Xbox. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to my history with it. And, you know, leave a comment below. What When did you decide to get an Xbox? Was it the same case as me where you saw Morrowind and you're like, I need this thing? Or did you see Halo and you're like, I have to get... What made you decide to get the Xbox over the GameCube at the launch? Right? Maybe that's a good question to start with. And uh, we'll go from there. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for watching, and I'm hyped for the Series X. Can't wait to see what kind of games they got coming out for it, and uh, I'll be covering that in the future. Thank you for watching.